This week, when I was asking God, what do I share with these people? And I was trying to get an insight into what he will have me say today. And um, God, interestingly, God just took me to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17. And I was trying to, you know, every time I don't question God, I only ask God questions. Um, asking God, okay, why is this going on? Why is this going on? I was having a conversation with a couple of pastors this week and I said, um, I don't know if I was still sharing it, but I said, I think I shared it in the workers' prayer yesterday. So, um, there is a train of a lot of false prophecy going on. Amen. And uh, you see that people have solely relied on what my pastor said as to what God has said. And it has become a very heavy distraction that they want what their pastor says above what the word of God says. And every prophecy that must be given to you must be backed up with scripture. If it's not found in the scripture, don't take it too solid. Because God will not speak outside his word. Everything God will say to you is in this word. And I want to say this to us is that learn to spend time with God. So when you come to church, church is not where pastor comes to declare over your life. Church is just where pastor comes to confirm what God has said to you in the closet. So that you don't get swayed and say, ah, the man of God preached today. You are excited. Man of God gave word. And then you disappear. But if you have spent time with God, God just confirms this is what I was saying to you. And then he repeats it in the mouth of the pastor or repeats it in the mouth of the worship person or something. And then you just say, God, okay, now I hear what you are saying. Because out of the mouth of one or two witnesses, the word is what? Established. So this is the story of um, Elijah. And um, a background story for this is that um, the people of Israel, as we always know, one of the stories, I like the children of Israel because they are just blessed people. They are one of the most interesting, even when I read the Bible, interesting characters. They had first-hand encounter with God. In all realms, nobody had encounter with God like these people. And God chose them for himself. And it's so interesting to understand that people can get familiar when they have access and lose the blessing. The children of Israel were a set of people that God called out of so many tribes through Abraham and said, these are my people. And God did want to trust this through the children. They saw dimensions of God that nobody on earth had seen. They witnessed it firsthand. Nobody told them that they could tell from generations to generations. Prophecies that were given were given to these ones. But even when Jesus came, they did not even believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They were still expecting another Messiah to come. That's to tell you how very funny this set of people are. So, here again in the book of Kings, they have turned away from God and they have started misbehaving as usual in their tradition. And God is so merciful. Every time I look at the children of Israel, I say, ah, this God we serve is a wonderful God. They will misbehave. God will just be angry after God will forgive them. And they will begin to run a smooth run. The one king will just come from nowhere. Then we will just enter him. He will manifest, carry the whole. And you know how bad it is? As the king worship, the children of Israel will follow the king. Everybody will just follow. That's, that's how powerful influence can be. Ruin a whole nation by his own decision. So it was this same time that the king had decided to follow other gods, like his fathers. And they were worshiping Baal. Now, Baal is, is, is assumed the god of the weather. It means that Baal was being prayed to to give them rain and good, anything that would make um, farming good, the, the harvest good. So they, they prayed to Baal because they wanted to have a good harvest. The rain will come and all that. That's why they were worshipping Baal. And this continued. Then one very crazy guy came from nowhere called Elijah. One of the greatest prophets of all time. And the guy was angry in his spirit, man. And he said, what kind of people are these? How can you leave God and begin to worship Baal? They became so powerful. 
powerful in their worship that the prophets of God became prophets of Ba. And this got Elijah angry. And he came and just said to Ahab, by this time, there will be no rain for three years. Three and a half years. There will be no rain. Now, what he wanted to prove to them was that if you say Ba is the God of the weather, I serve the living God that controls everything. So I have spoken to the God that determines what happens. So if you say Ba is this powerful, you will call that Ba now to bring that rain. So he said, I shut the heavens for three years. I said, there will be no rain. That was the raw power. Man, it's like somebody coming to say that. You know, there are some dimensions when I see in the Bible. Joshua who was fighting the war and said, Son, stand still. And I'm like, so people can't. They went from the level of talking to. This is started talking to the elements of creation. And they were responding to them. The Bible says the same thing. And Elijah, who was on the hand of Caleb, said unto him, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain this year, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Now, this was very interesting and instructive. And before this time, God had been doing a lot of things through Israel. And I'm so... Let me press forward. Verse 3. Then he said, Get thee hence, and turn the eastward, and hide thyself from the brook of chariots. Chariot. That is before Jordan. Now God told him to go to the eastward, hide thyself of the brook of chariot. That is before thee. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed there. Now God told Elisha to go to the brook of chariot. Elisha has declared that there will be no rain. Now look at this. And there will be no dew. So what that means is that you are about to experience famine, droughts. God now quickly told him, move from where you are to the brook of chariots. Now, you know, this was very instructive for me because after declaring that kind of a word, the next thing you want to do is that you need to depend on God for instruction for what to do next. Because even you, that way that will affect you. Yeah. You need to hear God for God. I have declared also, how do I survive? Because if everybody is going to die for this drought, I too will die. But you know, God will never leave his own. So God said to him, go to the brook of chariots. And I will send ravens to him. Now, one of the things about ravens, raven is one of the most notorious birds. You can think of, go and research on David. Ravens don't feed their young ones. They are so stingy. If they give birth, they leave their young ones. They don't bother how they survive. So survivor is the young one's own. So if God, number two, raven is an unclean animal, according to their Jewish culture. God now sends an unclean animal to come and give a Jewish man Food. He gave him burger because the Bible says bread and meat is burger. So bread was bring. The raven does not give food to his young one. So how will the raven now carry the food to go and give to man? One that cannot give his own. You should fear this God. When the Bible says he turns the heart of kings to wherever he wants, God is so dangerous. His God is a God to be trusted. So he took the raven and said, go and feed Elijah. And Elijah stared at the brook of Chariot. That brook has to have water. So God made water to the men in that brook. For a while. And the raven was bringing bread and meat. Boca to Elijah. Morning. And the, Elijah was largesting. Everybody was suffering and crying. While Elijah was eating water and drinking water. You know the brook would be cold. Fresh water. But you know something happened. After a while, the brook got dried. Chariot, chariot means cut off. Sometimes you ask yourself, why did God send me to a place where he knows that will not last? But God, you sent me here. 
but it looks like this thing did not last. I'm going somewhere. Sometimes it looks like God sends people who do not look like you to begin to do things, and it looks like you're associating with them. You cannot understand God. So, he went and did according to the word of the Lord, and he went to in the book of Chariot, and that is before Jordan. And the raven brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass for a while, the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. Now, when the brook dries up, what do you do? It means that you must look to God again for another instruction. One of the things I have found out in this our Christian work is that we are guided by instructions. You don't live your life by, by chance. Like, oh, life should just happen to me. No, you're supposed to be asking God, what next? How do I go about this? What do I do? Where do I go from here? What next should I do? Because if God has instructed, that's why I tell people that if God sends you to ministry, he will make the provision. You don't need to start manipulating. If God did not send you, you will struggle for it. So, when people begin to do this, ah, God, I want to go. Same way people are traveling out of the country. I like the idea of traveling after the country. But if God does not make things to be in place, you will struggle. And you'll be asking, ah, God, who sent me? Same way there are some jobs that if you enter, it might look very lucrative, but that's not where God is sending you to. So your life must be guided by God to be able to make things work easily. And so he got to this point. The brook was dried up. Then the Bible says, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there, Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Now, from one instruction to the other. Now, God is sending him from brook chariot that has dried up to Zarephath. And interestingly, when I was looking at this, Zarephath was not a... Yes, yeah, Zarephath was part of um, the land that Joshua conquered and gave to one of the sons, Esh Asher. But Asher did not con he did not what's the English to use now? He did not conquer completely the land. So he gave room for the Canaanites to still have room in that land. And that land now became a land that was full of pagan activities. Because Asher did not do what he was supposed to do. Praise the Lord. Now, Zarephath means refining. Zarephath means smiting furnace. So God takes him from a cut off place to a furnace. God takes Elijah from a cut off place. Remember chariot is cut off to a furnace. And I began to understand, God, why are you taking this man to this? You should have just done the provision normally. If you can send raving, why carry this man up and down? The second thing that I found out is that Zarephath happened to be the place where Jezebel was raised. I remember that Jezebel was one of the things that was making Elijah run up and down. So God was said, that was the time from where Jezebel came from. That's where her father lived. That's where they taught her all the idol worship and the bar worship is from there. God was sending him from the place he has been declaring in Israel. Hey, you are worshiping back. There will be no rain. God is now sending him to the place where they are custodians of that same thing. Sometimes you are asking God, why are you bringing me to this place to work with this kind of people? You might not understand. But if he has sent you, there's a reason for it. So God sent him and says, Go! Arise to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to sustain thee. A widow. Why did God not send a normal person? Sorry. Why would you use a widow? Now, widow means that her husband is dead. Abi? It means that the woman's source, because then it's assumed that men were the source, right? Was gone. 
and you are not sending her to a widow, it means that this woman would have been in a very critical condition. Naturally, widows are termed poor from scripture because they don't have help. Women really don't work those days. Apart from maybe when they are gleaning or something, but they hardly work. So, it means that this one will be poor. Remember when we talked about the story of Elisha? When the Elisha, when prophet died, the woman said, ah, they've come to carry my son, so, so she was in poverty. She must have been borrowing from Ope, from Pampo, Pampe, and all those people. And they've come. You know, they will just publish your name up and down. They'll be calling. Even Elijah must have, Elijah must have received a text. <laughs> Prophet Obidiah's wife is owing. Praise the Lord. Now, so God was sending him to the widow. And in my head, I was like, why are you sending him to so Because it was interested that why do you tag a widow, widow of Zarephath? So it means that there must have been so many widows in that land, but why this particular widow? And in my head, I was looking, okay, so if I'm going to go to a town and God is sending me to a widow, how will I now locate the widow? You didn't give me a name because this is a prophetic man. God should even tell him X, Y, Z. But God just said, the widow of Zarephath. So he arose, and I like Elisha. As God gives him instructions, he moves. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering stick. God always makes providence for things he has planned. Remember the story of Isaac? When he was going to take a wife for uh, um, um, Abraham's servant, when he was going to take a wife for Isaac, he said, if I get to the well and the woman I see that comes to help me um, give me water and give my camel water, this will be the... That was what he said. Truly, truly, who did he find there? Rebecca. So, because I was asking myself, how will this prophet locate this widow? But at the time Elisha, Elijah was arriving, the woman was going to gather sticks at the gates. So Elijah met her at the gates. God made the work easier. Have you understood that? You just look like you enter some place and you just look like, oh, you're looking for something. Someone just say, oh, yes, I'm the one in charge. And you're like, oh, wow. Or there's something that has been bothering you and you are trying to get it. And then you just get to someone and say, oh, no, I know somebody that knows who I God has positioned it already. Because God has sent you, he has made the work easy. That was the scenario for Elijah. Elijah. Then he said, he arose. The widow was there gathering stick and he called to her and said, fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Now, the woman did not go to the gate for welcome a visitor. She went to the gate to gather sticks. Coincidentally, she now met a prophet at the gate. And the prophet now said, give me water. You know, and when I was reading the scripture, I said, God, help us to have the right attitude. I am a widow. I am poor. And when you read this scripture, the Bible says, as she was going to fetch, if you read down to that scripture when she was saying, okay, and she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, okay, there was a part I want to get to where she was saying that, verse 12, that I, she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have to, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in barrel and a little oil in cruise and behold I'm gathering the two sticks that I two sticks I don't know why she specified two sticks two sticks that I may go and dress it for me and my son that we may eat and die sir ma who cooks food to eat and die why don't you die if you want to die why do you have to cook do you have to do a ceremony to die that's why sometimes some people say they want to commit suicide. Father, forgive me. And they say they are calling announcements. If I want to die, die. Why make it a public this thing? You're like, I will jump. Oh. <laughs> You're not ready to die. You say, we one day, my wife was saying she was hungry. I say, You're not hungry. Oh. If you are hungry, you will not be strolling up and down. If you are hungry, 
Anything that comes to you, you will. You don't know what's wrong, guys. When your stomach is squeezing, everything like you want to die. You can't be hungry and be cooking beans. Are you okay? Peace is three hours. I mean, two hours. Eh? It's like two hours. That's why they made instant noodles. Even when the noodles refuse to you, increase the fire. Like your eyes is cooking as the indomie is cooking. Because you cannot wait. Or you look for gari to drink. Soak the gari and drink. Even if the water is not entering the gari, you have put it in your mouth just to hold it. That's hunger. You can't be hungry and put beans. You will first pick the beans. You are not hungry. Oh. You are not hungry. So, this one was planning to die. She went to go and gather a stick. I said, let us cook the last flour that we had with the last oil and then we And then this man now comes. So, he said, go and get me water. And I like Elijah. When you know your onions, when you know who sent you, and you know who, whose you are, there are certain demands you will place. And the prophet just said to her, verse 10, and he called her, fetch me and pray thee, and bring me water in the vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to, she was taking the step to go and fetch it, he now called her and said, why come in? Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thy hand. <laughs> is this guy okay my reason for coming to the gate is because I want to come and cook food and die that is not enough for me and my son and the reason we want to cook it is because we want to die then you now come you never even send me you say I should go and bring water and as I was just going you say come 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 no. you know that kind of message don't go that same message like my wife can send you a message 10 times Babe, I'm not shitting, but... So if I want to attend, I want to just say, babe, just tell me all the message you want to send me. Because if I stand up from this chair now, you know how annoying it is. You stand up, you go and deliver the message. As you are now sitting down, you're not saying, oh, please help me bring the babies. This so me, what I do most of the time, I just say, babe, when I'm ready, because I like to do things at my own time, it will not be your time again. And I, you know, there are some messages that are annoying. There's one auntie, she's late now, that used to have, ah, that auntie can send a message for Africa. Ah, nobody visits her. Because if you visit her, your, your day is gone. She just brings one shirt and say, can you please help me iron it? That's the end. As you're ironing it, she's just with you. She's going to bring her. Ah, just add these three. And as you're finished, you just say, ah, I beg, I soak one cloth in the bedroom. Just help me to wash it. Before you know what's happening, your time. So nobody, if you go and visit, just stand at the door and say, ah, I just pass it by. Just say, come and say hello so that you can just go. You don't want to. We ah, no. You run. We run away because of Aaron and all that. Praise the Lord. So I can imagine how that woman would have felt like, oh. And then the guy said, go and bring a morsel. And she quickly told him. I said, and she said, as the God, and she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me, my son, that we may eat and die. And that began to trigger a lot of things for me. Eat and, dry and die. And I was like, ah, God, why would somebody be thinking in this dimension? And God just made me realize people are going through stuffs. People are going through a lot of issues in their life. People are going through a whole lot. And the only thing they are just thinking of is, if I cannot meet the demands for today, let me just do what I can do and take me home. And that's why you must be very sensitive to the people around you. Ah, my time is gone. God will help me. Ah, God will help me. And Elijah, and the woman said, well, Elijah spoke to her in verse 13 and said, fear not. Go and do as I have said. Now, I can understand the woman's pain. I could understand her fear. If I give you this morsel, what will I now have to feed myself and my son? Son, we are planning to eat this to die. 
At least maybe if they eat the food, it can sustain them. If they wanted to die quickly, they can die, add some additional days to it. But now you're not coming to ask for it. It means that you want to fasten our death. That's what you prophet is trying to do. But Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. He said, but make me therefore a little cake first. This was struck me. You should have not been selfish. You would have just said, okay, make the cake go and we will call me or we will not eat it together. He now said, no. Elijah did not say that. Oh. He said, make the cake and make it for me first. Then the rest. And then I said, God, this guy must very, be very mean. God said, no. Elijah represented me. Elijah said, give me first. And then you will see what I will do. It was a sign of honor. There are things that are in your hands that are little. God is asking, give me first. I had now realized that God is not in the business of looking for those who have abundance. Because he knows that your faith will be tested on your loyalty to him and your trust in him. I asked, why didn't you send Elijah to a person that had it so much? And God said, no. I want to know. Now, first of all, don't forget, this woman was a Gentile. She was not a Jew. And God said, I want to make them understand some certain things. And he was saying, would you give me what is in your hand? Would you give me what is in your hand? Give me what is in your hand. She was tested. And the woman went straight up to prepare the morsel. Now, you most of the time, God is not interested in your actions. God is interested in your hearts. Abraham did not kill Isaac when he was going to take Isaac to be sacrificed. He killed Isaac the very moment he accepted to kill Isaac as a sacrifice. That's when God knew that this one, ah, I can trust this one with the promise. Sometimes God is asking you for things. It's not that. It's not when it's convenient for you. It is when you respond. That God knows. In that moment, you settle your heart. God, I will do it. God says, okay, this heart is ready. And the woman went straight up to prepare the meal for Elijah. And look at what Elijah said. And Elijah said unto her, fear not. Go and do as thou said. But make therefore a little cake first and bring it unto me. And after, make thee for thy son. Make for thee and thy son. I was mad at Elijah. Are you okay? This woman is poor. You're not sensitive. And I remembered in the story when Jesus was asking them, the apostles were in the temple and Jesus Christ was asking them, this woman gave and this one has given. Who has given the most? Everybody saw the man that gave so much money as the one who has given more. But Jesus said, no. The one that gave all that she had. It might have been little, but she gave all. She has given the most. What God was trying to say was her heart. Check her heart. It's her heart. That's why we say God does not require us to give grudgingly. He requires us to give cheerfully. Her attitude showed a good posture. She did not grumble. She did not feel like, ah, who are you? I don't know you before. I was just on my own. I wanted to even just give you water. Now you now get more I'm going to pack your things and go. That would have been some of those response. But that was not her response. That was not her response. She kept it calm. Some of us are broke. And God wants to set us out of where we are broke. He's saying, give me what is in your hand. Ah, I looked at this and said, God, this is heavy. Remember, he did not go and meet someone that had abundance. But look at the sweet thing. Elisha said in verse 14, For thus said the God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail, until the day the Lord sended rain upon the earth. Instantly, Elijah saw her move, saw her intention, saw her direction, saw everything about her, and he began to declare, As you have obeyed, your bow, your jaw 
will not last for long. Your oil will not dry up until the day the rain shows up again. And that rain, that thing was for like three and a half years. Remember, the drought was in the land. So somebody was about to enter divine provision. He didn't say your jar will be full. I looked at this. I said, ah. Because it's the difference between the woman that Elijah poured was saying pour oil and go and sell. Her, her jar did not need to be full. Her oil did not need to be full that she had plenty. No. He just said, as long as that place where you are taking it from, it will never lack flour. It will never lack oil. As long as it's in that place. I, the Lord, have said it. You will never be in lack. You have not entered abundance yet, too, but you will never be in lack. There are dimensions. I said, wow. And then God took me to this part. Remember the boy when Jesus was praying, preaching to the 5,000? And they became hungry. Jesus now said, what do we do? We can't send. Some people say, send them away. Let them go. Uh, if, we, if we ask a bakery to bake, which bakery will bake 5,000 and I'll be able to feed these people at this time? It's not possible. But I realized that every time that you are in need, there's someone around that has something. And God is just willing to use that if you commit it to that. And Jesus said, okay, they said there's a guy with five, uh, five loaves and uh, two fishes. Send the guy out. And Jesus took this. And what did he do? He gave thanks and did what? He multiplied. And he fed the people. <laughs> that was the same principle that worked here. She gave to Elijah. Elijah blessed it. He multiplied. And as long as that jar was carrying flour and that cruise was carrying oil, there was never oil lacking in it. There was never flour missing in that place. It was always contained with what God has said. I pray for somebody in this place. As you give your seed, you give your commitment, you give everything to God, you will never experience lack in the name of Jesus. Yeah. You know, I was, I'm not, I've been trying to ask God, help me when it comes to the area of giving. And God said there are some principles that except a grain of seed fall on the ground and dies. There are certain things that must die to be able to produce. A seed cannot be a tree in your hand. It has to fall somewhere to germinate. It has to fall to the ground to die, to become a tree. So you cannot keep holding your seed. God just said, you cannot keep holding the seed. If you keep holding the seed, you will not get a tree. That seed must be planted. That seed must be sown. That seed must be given onto the ground for it to die. Then it will come up. And the last thing I picked from that scripture. God is not interested in full vessels. God is interested in empty vessels. God is not interested in people who are qualified. God is interested in people that have issues. So be grateful to God that you have issues in your life. Because you know why? He's the God that solves problems. God will not go to anybody that has already helped. In your weakness is his strength made perfect. It's not in your strength, it's his strength made perfect. Something has to be wrong with you to be, for you to be able to see the hand of God. He saw Gideon and said to Gideon, Almighty man of value. Gideon that was hiding in wine press. God was calling him mighty. Gideon was a farmer. God was calling him a mighty man of value. When God was done with Gideon, Gideon became a mighty man of valor. 300 men to destroy an army of over 32,000 with just what? Trumpet, pitcher, and torchlight. He didn't raise any, he didn't find no, nothing, no. He didn't do anything. He just obeyed instruction. And God just said, blow trumpet, break pitcher, and be shaking torch. Oto, they won the battle. Or is it Moses? Moses was well learned in Egyptian knowledge. He was filled with a lot of things. God said, if I want to use you, oh God, you cannot be just okay. Oh. God had to, Moses, you cannot, if you want to work with me, God had to send him to the school of 
shipry into the wilderness for 40 years. All the knowledge of Egypt that Moses had, he was stripped of it. How did God strip it of him? By telling him to be talking to sheep. A man that was so vast in Egypt. Do you know what? Egypt at that time was world power. Egypt at that time knew a lot of things. Science. Too many things. So you can imagine the level of wisdom that Moses had. And God now said that wisdom translated into sheep. I want to take you to a dimension. He didn't know that God was going to use him to be able to school the Israelites who were even worse than the sheep. And when Moses was about to go, when God sent him, he said, I am but a stammerer. And after that time I checked, I did not see where Moses stammered. When God was done with him, he started talking with boldness. Can you hand over that issue that you have in your life to God? Can you trust God enough with the little in your hand? Oh God, I don't have in my account. I don't have in this. God is saying, I don't care. If you want me to do this, trust me. I am the one who makes provision. Oh, that little talent or gift that you have here, and God is saying, trust me with it. Let me amplify it for you. Hand it over to me in thanksgiving. And I realized something. I close. God showed me two things in conclusion. It was just simple faith, simple trust, and obedience that God used in getting this miracle come to pass. The woman trusted God. She obeyed and had a little faith that if I give this man, I perceive he's a man of God. If I obey, I know that I will not lack. And her miracle came true. The second thing God showed me in this scripture that God will use unconventional things to teach us things. So you need to be careful when you are becoming so judgmental. That's why in the gift church we say it's a no judgment zone. Some of us have put something, ah, no, these are the things of the world. I cannot associate myself with it. She was a gentile. The Jews had no business. But she was the one who made provision for Elijah. And throughout the drought, she took care of Elijah. It was from that provision that God multiplied that Elijah was feeding from for that three and a half years. So don't say that your blessing will come only from Christians. God can use men of the world to be able to help you and bless you. That's why your attitude must be right. Yes, sir. That's why your attitude must be right. You can't just start saying, ah, no, eh, we're not of the same kingdom. No, so we cannot. No, you will, get, you will die in poverty. You will die in misery. So if God is saying, go, that's why you cannot be saying, I, I don't talk to my neighbor. Eh, he's not a, she's not a church person. She's just, a, let your light shine before men. They will see your good, good works and give glory to your father. All the people that were around, they did not help Elijah. It was somebody from another place that helped. And she was a widow. The final thing. The two things that the woman had and then God showed to me was she had a meal and oil. And the two things signify two things. She had the word and she had the Holy Spirit. You might not have it full but if you have it in measure, as you begin to grow, you'll be sustained. You might not be all loaded. Ah, I have come to the fullness. No man will come to the fullness. But be rest assured, and I preached it last week about the word. If you have the word, and this is our year of the Holy Spirit, and you have the Holy Spirit to guide you, you are settled. You are settled. Father, thank you. You know, I, I, I will say this with all humility. If it's in your heart, if the seed is in your heart, then it will enter into your hand. When God gives you instruction on certain things, you might not have it. God is not necessary, but God is telling you because God knows he wants to help you. The Bible says he gives seeds to the sower and bread to the eater. He's a sufficient God if God can use a raven to feed Elijah, God can use anybody to take care of him. Say, why? Say, why worry? If the bears would land, they did not do anything. I take care of them. Are you not of more value to me than them? You are thinking, oh God, where's my next meal going to come from? Trust him. What God is going to say, he daily loads us with his benefit. My God shall supply all my needs. He didn't say once. 
He said needs. So what you need is what God will supply. The need is in abundance. I just want to say, God, I am willing to surrender. I just want to pray that prayer for the next one or two minutes. God, I'm willing to surrender. I am willing to surrender. I will not hold back anything. I will not for any reason hold back anything. If you would ask me, I would give. If you would send me, I will go. Whatever you say, Lord, I will do. Whatever, I will not struggle. I will not grudgingly give. I will not struggle. If you say go here, I will go. If you say do this, I will do. I trust you enough. I trust you. I trust you enough. I trust you. But I will thank you. To you be all the glory, Lord. To you be all the honor. To you be all the praise. To you be all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Have you been blessed today?